Good morning, students, and welcome to Sandhan. Today's topic is Dr. Johnson as a critic. English poet, essayist, critic, journalist, lexicographer, conversationalist, regarded as one of the outstanding figures of the 18th century life and letters. Johnson's literary reputation is part dependent on James Boswell's biography, The Life of Samuel Johnson, with whom he formed one of the most famous friendships in literary history. I have with me today Dr. Indira Nityanandam, who will be guiding us on Johnson as a critic. Welcome to Sandhan. Ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Nityanandam has done her doctoral thesis on Indian women's writing in English. Her field of special interest is translation studies, Indian writing in English, diaspora, and ELT. At present, she is serving as the principal of Srimati S.R. Mehta Arts College. She is also the chairperson of the Board of U Studies for English Gujarat University. Without wasting any time, ma'am, may I request you to start, please? Thank you, Namita. Good morning, my dear students. Samuel Johnson. Dr. Samuel Johnson, not to be confused with Ben Johnson. Remember, my dear students, right from the spelling, there's a great world of difference between the two. When we talk of Dr. Samuel Johnson, remember, we are in the 18th century. When we talk of Ben Johnson, we go back to the age of Shakespeare. We are in the Elizabethan age. Ben Johnson has J-O-N-S-O-N, -N, whereas Dr. Samuel Johnson has J-O-H-N-S-O-N. What do we remember him as? Of course, we are going to talk about him as a critic, but you cannot talk about a person like Dr. Johnson only as a critic. When we think of him, as Namita just mentioned, there are many roles that he performed. There are many achievements that he has to his credit. And therefore, next slide please. If you look at all that he has been doing, he is certainly a multifaceted personality. He's a poet. One of his most famous poems is London. And again, because it's a common name, do not confuse it with the better known poem, London, by William Blake. He's a critic, and we're going to talk about it at great length. He was an essayist contributing to the periodicals of his time, the Rambler, the Idol, Idler, in particular. He was a biographer and he was a lexicographer. Maybe for some of you, the word lexicographer is something new. Maybe the word lexicography does not really figure in your everyday knowledge of the English language. The common word that we use is dictionary. Today we call it dictionary. It used to be called a lex lexicograph and somebody who writes a dictionary, right? You don't have a writer, you don't have an author of a dictionary, but somebody who compiles the words together, puts them together, used to be called a lexicographer. And when we think of Dr. Johnson, this was one of his most important contributions, not only to his age, but to the English language also. Remember, whenever we look at a writer, we cannot look at him in isolation. Most of you students are in the third year and therefore you already have behind you two years of English literature studies. You are aware of many of the ages. You are aware of many of the writers. So let us quickly try and see who were the contemporaries of Dr. Samuel Johnson. You have Addison and Steele. Do you remember the spectator? Do you remember how much they contributed to the growth of the English essay, particularly what we refer to as the periodical essay. Do you remember, some of you at least, Sir Roger D. Coverley? Do you remember the Coverley papers? How both these writers attempted to bring philosophy out of the closets into the marketplace and the coffee houses. 
The next writer that I think you should know in this age is Alexander Pope. The Rape of the Lock, I'm sure, comes to mind. The Mock Heroic, I'm sure you remember Belinda, who was based on Arabella Fermo. I'm sure you know the lock here does not refer to the key and the lock, but it refers to a lock of hair. Who were the other major writers of this period? Richardson, Fielding, Smollett, Stern. I'm putting them together because all of them were novelists. And remember, in your history of literature, you have certainly studied that the novel as a literary form really began in this age. You might go back to Boccaccio and think of him as one of the first writers of tales, of stories in Europe. But when we think of English literature in particular, it is the 18th century which really saw the growth and development of the novel as a literary form. Richardson and Fielding are two important names, but we must have Smollett and Stern also. The next writer is Goldsmith. Remember Oliver Goldsmith? He was a poet, he was a dramatist, he was a critic, he was an essayist, he was a novelist. You have all these that he has contributed. And then Jonathan Swift. Remember Gulliver's Travels? Remember the wonderful Lilliputians? Remember the giants in the land of Brobdingnag? And that brings me to Dr. Johnson. What is the age in which Dr. Johnson lived? What is the age that you call it? Do you call it the neoclassical age? Do you call it the age of Queen Anne? Do you call it the Augustan age? All these names are equally correct and different writers, different critics prefer to call them, call this age by different names. Neoclassical because it was attempting, neoclassical because it was attempting to rival the classical age of ancient Rome. The age of Queen Anne because she was ruling. Remember we talk of the Elizabethan age, we talk of the Victorian age and here we talk of the age of Queen Anne. We talk of the Augustan age because, remember, Augusta Caesar was an important ruler of ancient Rome. What are the characteristics of this age? Johnson himself believed, many critics believe, and I think most of you would agree, that the age in which the writer lives influences his thinking and his writing in great measure. So when we look at the characteristics of this age, the 18th century, the neoclassical age, one important discovery, invention, that contributed to an increase in the reading public is the printing press. Remember the Industrial Revolution, remember the printing press, remember these periodicals that started coming out. I'm sure you know that earlier when you wrote something, you had to make copies of it. No Xeroxes in those days, my dear students. You had to sit and copy and then give it to others. But once the printing press was there, you could make hundreds of thousands of copies at the same time. Another characteristic of this period, which I've already mentioned, is the growth of the novel, the growth of the periodicals, the essay as a literary form. I'm sure you know the word genre. A little difficult to pronounce, get the spelling right and I'm sure you'll have your pronunciation right. The essay as a literary form or a literary genre. Remember, not the personal essay which Charles Lamb was later going to make very popular, but the periodical essay as a literary genre was another important facet, aspect of this age. What are coffee houses? Today, I'm sure many of you love to sit and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee for many hours together. And there are many such coffee houses in most parts of our country today. But what were these coffee houses? Yes, similar to the ones we have today, but different to some extent. Because you had these groups of intellectuals, maybe artists, maybe writers, they met there regularly and they sat together and they talked about important things. When I say important, it could be literature, it could be society, it could be politics, it could be books. There was a lot of discussion and Dr. Johnson himself was a frequent visitor 
to some coffee houses. It's interesting when we see that there was a table at which all these people sat. And I believe in those days, on the other tables, there were people sitting, pretending to drink their coffee, but actually wanting to listen to what these people were saying. Isn't it interesting? We wouldn't call it eavesdropping. We wouldn't call it bad manners. But we would say this was a wonderful way of seeing what great people talked about. And you had writers, you had painters like Joshua Reynolds sitting together and discussing many important things. Next slide, please. That now brings me to Dr. Johnson. Let us quickly try and see what are his major works. We are to talk about Johnson as a critic, but I would like to tell you that Dr. Johnson did not write any great critical treatises. When you think of Coleridge, you think of Biographia Literaria, but when you think of Dr. Johnson, you don't have any one work like that. Then, how is it that we come to our conclusions about Dr. Johnson as a critic? You know, you have to select, you have to cull, you have to read between the lines in order to understand what he actually wrote. As a writer, Dr. Johnson showed wit, sharpness of mind, fascinating Latinisms and short Anglo-Saxon words. Many of his works, let me tell you, my dear students, went into major reprints even during his own time. Before I come to preface to Shakespeare, let me talk about a couple of his works which are not so well known. His first work was translation of Jerome Lobo's Voyage to Abyssinia in 1735. And then he had Irene, which is an unfinished tragedy. That brings me, that brings me to preface to Shakespeare about which we will be talking at length later. We will talk about lives of poets, the number of lives that he wrote. It actually began as a series of introduction to a collection of English poets. Then you have Rasselis, his only novel. More than 200 editions in many languages. The story is like an adventure story, not very popular, most of us don't read it, but it is the story of an Abyssinian prince who escapes from his palace along with his sister to see the outside world. Johnson was known for his witticism. Johnson was known for his precise definitions. I'd just like to give you a line from Rasselas where he says, Marriage has many pains. Celibacy has no pleasures. Let me repeat that. Marriage has many pains. Celibacy has no pleasures. Then you have his poem, London, which is a modernization of the Roman poet Juvenal's third satire. You have another poem, Vanity of Human Wishes, which was a great success even during his own time. Time permitting, maybe I shall read you some passages from both these poems. Then we come to the Dictionary of the English Language. He started planning this sometime in 1746, but the first edition appeared only in 1755. So for nine long years, this is what Dr. Johnson was doing, collecting, collating words. Because as I told you, you can't write a dictionary. What you really need to do is to compile a dictionary. And what can we say about Johnson's achievement as a lexicographer? That he has superb precise definitions, that he has immense quotations. That's what makes his first dictionary, a dictionary of the English language, very, very interesting, informative, even today. Another major contribution of Dr. Johnson is his essays to the periodicals Rambler and the Idler. In fact, Dr. Johnson started by contributing to the Gentleman's Magazine, where actually he was himself the editor for a few years. In fact, it was his first job. 
other writings of Dr. Johnson that we should just remember when we are thinking of the contribution of Dr. Johnson is the short lives that he wrote of his contemporaries as well as the parliamentary debates. I believe in those days you could not enter parliament and jot down anything. So people had to come out after the session of parliament, the British parliament, they would come out and they would talk about what happened, what were the arguments, what the debates that took place and then Dr. Johnson on the basis of those little notes that he got, I believe he would write the entire debate. This gives us some idea of his ability as a writer, as well as his ability to create, as well as his ability to think. These, my dear students, are the major writings of Dr. Johnson. When we call him a multifaceted personality, we must remember that he was a poet, novelist, dramatist, essayist, critic, and a lexicographer, in addition to being a biographer. Let us now move on to talking about Dr. Johnson as a critic. What is criticism? Most of you know about it. What are the major kinds of criticism? I'm sure you know that too. When did criticism begin? Probably criticism began when the first literary work was written. This criticism might have been formal. It might have been informal. It might have been oral. It might have been written. But whenever there is a work of art, and remember, we use the word criticism in a very general sense too. And therefore, you could have criticism, art criticism, when somebody has an exhibition of his paintings. You could have film criticism when a new movie is released. You could have modern books. You could have bestsellers. You could have critics writing about that. But of course, we as students of literature are interested in literary criticism. Let us see what are the major, the chief characteristics of Dr. Johnson as a critic. When we think of criticism, we wonder whether criticism can be true for all times or whether criticism changes with every age. Is the criticism of Plato and Aristotle or Longinus and Horace the same as that of Sidney and Ben Johnson? Is the criticism of Addison the same as that of Dr. Johnson? And what happens when we move to the Romantic Age, later still into the Victorian Age, into the 20th century, when you have critics like I.A. Richards, when you have critics like T.S. Eliot? Remember, each age has its own concept of criticism. Dr. Johnson was very clear that criticism is basically divisible into two parts. What is fundamental and indispensable and what is accidental or prescribed by custom. Let me repeat that. Some things are fundamental and indispensable. That means you must have that in order to consider something good criticism. You have a second part, something which could be accidental or because of time and custom it has become sacrosanct. These prescriptions of authority keep changing with every age. But the first, the fundamental and indispensable, according to him, is always based on nature and reason. That brings us to the first point of Johnson as a critic. And that is the historical approach. In fact, Dr. Johnson has been called the true father of historical criticism in English. What does he mean by this? When you look at a critic, you have to remember that he is conditioned by his age and environment. When you look at a writer, that is when a critic looks at a writer, he should not judge the writer on the basis of the age in which the critic lives. For example, Dr. Johnson lived in the 18th century and he's talking about a writer who lived in the 16th century or in the 17th century. Should Dr. Johnson be judging Shakespeare and Milton, for example, by the standards of Dr. Johnson's age, 
that is the 18th century, the neoclassical age, or should he be judging Shakespeare by the age in which he wrote? Dr. Johnson is very, very clear on this point. He says, we must remember that every writer lives in a particular age and environment. And therefore, when he talks about Shakespeare, when he talks about the violence that Shakespeare showed on his stage, which the neoclassical writers and critics and people and reading public could not accept, Dr. Johnson says, let us go back to the Elizabethan age. Let us see under what circumstances, for what audience Shakespeare wrote. And then we will realize that violence was essential in the tragedies or the historical plays of Shakespeare. He talks about Milton's Paradise Lost and he justifies many of the things which the 18th century critic found unacceptable. Dr. Johnson was very clear that unless you look at a writer about the age in which he lives, unless you link him with the age in which he lives, unless you are able to see the environment in which he wrote, you will not be able to really understand the greatness, to assess the real contribution of the writer. And therefore, he says, to judge rightly of an author, we must transport ourselves to his time and examine what were the wants of his contemporaries and what were his means of supplying them. And this is what he does when he looks at Shakespeare and Milton two great writers, according to all of us, and of course, according to Dr. Johnson, too. What does he say about poetry? He says, poetry is the art of uniting pleasure with truth by calling imagination to the help of reason. Please remember, he is giving equal importance to imagination and to reason equal importance to imagination and to reason. That means, my dear students, to him, great poetry can be born only out of a proper combination of the head and the heart. The head and the heart. Remember, when we reach the Romantic Age, which we shall do soon after the Neoclassical Age, we think of imagination as being very important. And therefore, we think the head or reason has got nothing much to do. But Dr. Johnson was very clear that great poetry has to unite imagination as well as reason. And therefore he says, in the imitation of truth, it is guided by reason, and in affording pleasure, it is by imagination. Truth, to be poetic, has to be pleasure-giving. You remember an ode which was to be written much later? by a very young poet who says, truth is beauty, beauty, truth. And therefore, truth to be poetic has to be pleasure giving, is what Dr. Johnson says. What is good poetry? After we have defined poetry, what is good poetry? How do we test good poetry? How do we decide that some poetry is good and some is not? Here, he talks about the importance of time. He says that only that poetry which pleases many and pleases long, pleases many and pleases long. He gives importance to the time. How long is a poet popular? How long is a poet read? If it pleases long, that is for a long period of time, then it is good poetry. But at the same time, Dr. Johnson is very clear that it should not appeal to only one class, to one age, to one group. It should please many. Many would mean all sections of society, different sections of society, people of different ages. By ages, I, am, I mean age. That is the age that they are, not the age spelt with a capital A because that would come under pleases long. It has to be able to speak a universal language. 
able to speak a universal language because if it has to please many and if it has to please long, the language that is used should not be some kind of jargon. The language that is used should not be something that only one class can understand. You know, we use words like slang and jargon. You know what it means. Certain words in our language, any language, whether it's Hindi or Gujarati or English or any language in any part of the world, if it is used only by a particular group, only a particular group understands it, if it is relevant only to a particular profession, then we call it jargon. When we use the word slang, I'm sure you understand that this is not a language which is accepted in writing. It is not a language which is ex accepted in educated society, in polite society. Slang is okay for everyday colloquial conversation, but not for writing. And therefore, Dr. Johnson insists on poetry being able to speak a universal language, a language that can be understood by all. What about meter? Remember, the neoclassical age believed in rules. They believed in means and sometimes they thought that the end was not important. Dr. Johnson did not do that. To him, both the means and the end were equally important. And therefore, remember, he talked about pleasure, pleasing is after all an end. In order to do that, what do you use? What is the means? The means is universal language. And another thing that he insists on is regular meters. Please look at the word. It's not matters. It's regular meters. The importance of regular meter, not what the Romantic age was going to do, that meter was not important. And therefore, even great poets like Wordsworth had different meters in different poems. The importance of regular meters, I insist that you correct that, my dear students. Regular meters were important because, he says, only then will poetry really appeal. And in order to do this, he talks about the kind of language. Remember the figures of speech that you have heard about, you have read about, that you have seen in the poetry that you have read over the last two years, the last two and a half years maybe? What are the figures of speech that you know? Some of you might remember very difficult ones like synecdoche and metonymy and onomatopoeia and oxymoron. But when we think of figures of speech, when we think of alankar in any of our languages, the first two that come to our mind are the simile and the metaphor. Remember, even in our everyday language, we use so much, so many similes, so many metaphors. They've become so common that we refer to them as dead metaphors. They don't surprise us anymore. They don't please us anymore. As cold as ice, as hot as fire, as black as coal, as white as milk, all these are very, very common similes. But to Dr. Johnson, the similes were very important. He says that great poets, when you look at their writing, you will notice the greatest of poets have regular meters and then the use of similes is very good. He gives you examples from Dryden. He gives you examples from Milton to prove his point. And when he talks about these poets, he is also convinced that, he is convinced that the greatest form of poetry is the epic. No wonder there are so few epics in the world. Think of any language in the world, there might not be more than one or two epics. As is true of the English language, and you know that John Milton in the Puritan age wrote the first epic in the English language. Johnson has great praise for the epic as a literary genre. The two which he does not much care for, and in fact he is very critical of, are the pastoral and the Pindaric ode. My dear students, those of you who have heard of Lycidas, have read Lycidas, have studied it probably as part of your syllabus, might remember that Dr. Johnson was very critical of Lycidas. He thought it was artificial, 
He thought there was no true grief in it. And one of the reasons for that is he considered the pastoral and the Pindaric ode to be not very good as poetic forms. And therefore, his criticism of these forms. When I talk about the lives of poets a little later, we shall look at this criticism in greater detail. Next uh, slide, please. Then we move on to what he says about drama. He says, any good play has to be a faithful mirror of manners and life. Faithful mirror of manners and life. The writer lives in a particular period, in a particular age, in a particular environment. I'm repeating this point again and again, my dear students, because all Johnson's criticism has this as the basis. And therefore, when he talks about drama, he says that it has to be a faithful mirror of manners and life. Being a species of poetry, it should hold up, he says about drama, it should hold up a faithful mirror of manners and of life. It should present human sentiments in human language. A story in a play, according to him, is a picture either of an individual or of human nature in general. If it be false, it is a picture of nothing. A great play is not a story of a few men, but of men in all ages. Their actions, their thoughts, their passions is what they depict. All plays depict, all good plays depict. And that is why he says Shakespeare is great because of this reason. Let us look at the unities. Remember, you have studied Aristotle as a critic. You have heard about Aristotle. And he knew, you do know that he talked about the three unities. Remember, the three unities of time, place and action. According to Dr. Johnson, the other two, that is time and place, are not very important. He believes in unity of action. He gives us various reasons for it and if you look at some of his writings maybe you will find it in detail but at the moment I just want to remind you about what is unity of action. That is all the actions in a play should be one inseparable whole. That means the threads. Remember the Vidushak what he is doing. He is holding the play together. Remember the chorus they step in whenever you feel that the play is getting out of hand. He believes that all the action in any good play should become one inseparable whole. And therefore, he says that the unity of action is important. He argues why unity of place and unity of time are not important. Do we need to make play credible? any play, any drama, he says, the necessity of observing the unities of time and place arises from the supposed necessity of making the drama credible. But Dr. Johnson believes that when you go to see a play, you know it's a play. You accept that it's a play. So if at one moment, if this could be Ahmedabad, Gandhinagar, and if the next scene takes you to Mumbai or Delhi, he says, why not? If in one scene you are in 2001 and in the next scene you are in 2005, Dr. Johnson says, so what? What's the problem? Because if you can imagine that you are in 2001, if you can imagine that you are in Ahmedabad, you can also imagine that you are in Mumbai and that you are in 2005. This is how he argues against the need for the unities of time and place. But when he comes to the unity of action, he says that we must, must have unity of action because otherwise the audience or the reader, depending on whether you're reading a play or seeing a play, you will not be able to appreciate it in its totality. When we go to watch a play, 
all of us know that it is imitation, imitation of life. I've already talked about poetry being a mirror to life, according to Dr. Johnson. And therefore, he says, natural human pleasure comes in imitation. Whenever we see a picture, he says, Dr. Johnson says, it is as good as seeing the original. We cannot see the original. So what is shown to us on the stage? What is presented by a dramatist? An imitation of the original. And the human mind is capable of appreciating the imitation or the copy as much as it does the original. And this is the pleasure that we get when we read a play, when we watch a play. That brings me to another point, the tragic comedy. There have been critics down the ages who have criticized even great dramatists like Shakespeare for introducing comedy in his tragedies. One of the scenes that comes to my mind immediately probably is the gravedigger scene in Hamlet, which some of you might remember. Ophelia is dead, Laetus walks in with, his bo with her body, Hamlet is grieving, and then you have the gravediggers talking about the skulls. Should Shakespeare have introduced it? Many critics believe that it takes away from the tragic mood. Many critics believe that it heightens the tragic mood. Dr. Johnson himself is very clear on this point. He says, since in life, tragedy and comedy, pain and pleasure, joy and sorrow come together, it should come together also in a play. It must appeal to us only because it is natural, only because it seems real. And therefore, you should not have a play which is full of sorrow or a play which is full of joy and happiness. So no full tragedies or full comedies. He says we must have tragedy and comedy being combined together because this is what, according to him, approaches life. The next point that we have to look at when we think of him as a critic is practical criticism. How does he do that? He applies his judgment to his authors, to the contemporaries or to earlier authors. This is what he does. And he finds that you cannot have rules by themselves. All rules should be tested by application. And this is what he does. For a very, very quick recapitulation, we have been talking about the chief characteristics, right? All the characteristics of Johnson as a critic. But when you look at Johnson, I also want you to remember Johnson as a man. And therefore, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the life of Dr. Johnson. And then, of course, I shall go on and read to you some passages from Johnson's great works of criticism. Life of Dr. Johnson by James Boswell. He was born in 1740 and died in 1795. You would remember that Dr. Johnson was born in 1709 and died in 1784. Who was Boswell? Who was Boswell? Boswell was a writer, was a small writer. He went on a tour to a place called Corsica and then he wrote an account of his travel it was quite popular, and so immediately he got the epithet Corsica Boswell. He then took a tour of the Hebrides with Dr. Johnson in 1773, and both of them published separate accounts. He wrote 70 essays for the London magazine. You might ask me why this is important, because a lot of what we know about Dr. Johnson comes through to us by this wonderful biography called Life of Dr. Johnson. The first edition was published in 1791, the second in 1793, and the third in 1799. So can you imagine within a span of eight years, you already had three editions. Here's something interesting about Boswell that his surname has passed into the English language as a term. 
Boswell, Boswellian, Boswellism. For anyone who is a constant companion and observer, especially one who records those observations in print. Because this is what Boswell did. James Boswell, he just stuck on to Dr. Johnson everywhere, went with him, sat with him, walked with him, traveled with him, and then wrote the life of Dr. Johnson. But you know, my dear students, it's interesting to see that this biography is not the biography of one individual. In a true sense, it is a biography of the literature and the literary men of Great Britain of that period. Dr. Johnson, of course, is the hero. Dr. Johnson, of course, is a central character. And if you want to use a word we use in novels, he's the protagonist. And of course, in any bi biography, he would be the main character about whom the biography is being written. But when you see him in the company of Goldsmith, when you see him in the company of Burke, when you see him in the company of Joshua Reynolds, you see not only Dr. Johnson, but you see also these great people. And it must be said to Boswell's credit that he is able to project all these writers in very, very realistic terms. Of course, Johnson comes out as the hero. All of them are certainly lesser figures. But remember, after all, he was a he hero worshipped Dr. Johnson. And therefore, he wrote this life of Dr. Johnson. Who does he compare Dr. Johnson to? It's very interesting. He compares him to Ulysses. Have you heard of Ulysses? Of the great epics? the Greek and Roman epics, the Iliad and the Iliad. You remember the travels of Ulysses? You remember the adventures that he had? And he says that Dr. Johnson had the ability to travel in time as Ulysses had traveled in space. That is the type of honor, credit, hero worship that we see in, Dr. in Boswell's writing of his biography of Dr. Johnson. Next slide, please. To what extent has Boswell become popular? You must have heard of Sherlock Holmes. You must have heard of his fantastic detective ability. Sherlock Holmes had his constant companion, Dr. Watson, and he calls him my Boswell. That is the kind of companion, you know, constant companion who lives with you all the time. So that's about the great biography of Dr. Johnson, which gives us a clear picture of Johnson as a person, as a writer, and as a great individual. Let us now spend some time talking about two important works from which we get our ideas from which we draw our conclusions about Dr. Johnson as a critic. The first one that I would like to talk about is Lives of Poets. Dr. Johnson himself called it Little Lives and Little Prefaces to a Little Edition of the English Poets. I've just listed some of the poets. What is interesting is, Dr. Johnson did not set out to write this book. Some publisher who was planning to bring out an anthology of British poetry approached Dr. Johnson and asked him whether he would write a little introduction to each of these poets. My dear students, I'm sure you've seen many anthologies. Some of them have been prescribed to you. So when you open a book and there is one poem, On His Blindness, by John Milton, for example, you have about eight or ten lines about Milton and then something about the poem, maybe. You open another page, you've got The Solitary Reaper by William Wordsworth, you've got something about Wordsworth. Now, this is what the publisher wanted Dr. Johnson to do. And what did Dr. Johnson do? He wrote so much that finally this book, all that he wrote, the collection did not become a part of the anthology at all, but was instead published as Lives of Poets. Can you imagine somebody asking you to write ten lines 
and you writing maybe thousand lines about that author, about that poet. Who were these poets? Today, when we look at them about about 200 years later, many of these poets are not important to us at all. But remember, we are talking about the 18th century where a particular publisher wanted to bring out. So if you apply Dr. Johnson's test, you would find they, they could not please long. That is, with a span of 200 years, these poets are no more considered great poets. But in Johnson's own time, they were considered great poets. And that is why this particular publisher wanted to bring out a collection of the important poems written by these poets. I could go on and on about what he wrote about each of these poets. But I want to draw your attention to just one or two because they show us Johnson as a critic in the real sense of the term. Some of you might have in your second year or first year or probably in your third year of BA come across a group of poets to whom we refer as the metaphysical poets. The metaphysical poets and usually we have the name of John Donne. Why were they called metaphysical poets? Isn't it strange that it is Dr. Johnson who gave them this name? Very interesting because he was actually writing, he was actually writing a biographical note, remember, for that anthology on Cowley. Today we don't talk about Cowley as much as we talk about Dunn. But at that stage, Cowley was considered an important poet. And therefore, Dr. Johnson writes, Cowley, like other poets who have written with narrow views and instead of tracing intellectual pleasure to its natural sources, in the mind of man, paid their court to temporary prejudices, etc., etc. And he goes on. About the beginning of the 17th century, he writes, appeared a race of writers that may be termed the metaphysical poets. So Dr. Johnson calls them the metaphysical poets, of whom, in a criticism on the works of Cowley, it is not improper to give some account. My dear students, the double negative so beautifully used, not improper, what does it become? It becomes proper. And therefore, he defines and describes the group that we talk today as metaphysical poets. The metaphysical poets were men of learning, and to show their learning was their whole endeavor. But unluckily, resolving to show it in rhyme, instead of writing poetry, they only wrote verses. And very often such verses as stood the trial of the finger better than of the ear, for the modulation was so imperfect that they were only found to be verses by counting the syllables. I think it's terrible criticism for a group of poets who we still consider to be very important. Milton and Dryden are there, Congreve is there, Gray is there, Swift is there. These are names you know, my dear students. But there are also names like Edmund Smith, almost unknown to us today, most of us students and teachers of English literature. You've got Littleton, you've got Gay, maybe you've heard of him. Dr. Johnson is such a great critic that I realize we really have to rush through because I want to spend a couple of minutes talking to you about his preface to Shakespeare. In this preface, a beautifully written work, he talks about the importance of comparison as a tool. In order to understand the importance, the greatness of one writer, you must be able to compare him to other writers, maybe of the same period. He then talks about why we consider Shakespeare to be such a great writer. What are the reasons for his continued popularity to this day? And he says, he was a poet of nature. Shakespeare, he says, is above all writers, at least above all modern writers, the poet of nature. The poet that holds up to his readers a faithful mirror of manners and of life. His characters are not modified by the customs of particular places, unpracticed by the rest of the world, by the peculiarities of studies, etc. 
His persons act and speak by the influence of those general passions and principles by which all minds are agitated, and the whole system of life is continued in motion. What are the other qualities that make Shakespeare a great writer? According to Dr. Johnson, his ability at characterization. Real, natural characters as they existed in the days of Shakespeare. And his ability, his ability to write tragedy comedy. Remember, we've already talked about the importance of tragedy comedy. How does he conclude that Shakespeare is a great writer? How does he conclude? He gives us various reasons. And then he says, and it's beautiful, the simile that he uses, the work of a correct and regular writer is a garden, accurately formed and diligently planted, varied with shades and scented with flowers. The composition of Shakespeare is a forest in which oaks extend their branches and pines tower in the air, interspersed sometimes with weeds and brambles and sometimes giving shelter to myrtles and to roses filling the eye with awful pomp and gratifying the mind with endless diversity. Other poets display cabinets of precious rarities, minutely finished, wrought into shape and polished into brightness. Shakespeare opens a mine which contains gold and diamonds in inexhaustible plenty, though clouded by incrustations debased by impurities and mingled with a mass of meaner minerals. And remember the mines, the deeper you go, the better you get. It has been much disputed, he says, whether Shakespeare owed his excellence to his own native force or whether he had the common helps of scholastic education and the examples of ancient authors. If you have the time, you must look at a book like this which has a collection of some fantastic critical writing down the ages. It would help to sometimes read the writer themselves than to read only about the writer. My dear students, do read the writers themselves because then you will be able to appreciate the real greatness of the writer. Let us now try and conclude about Dr. Johnson as a critic. Dr. Johnson, a multifaceted personality, what did he do? What did he achieve? What is his contribution to English literary criticism? Of the 18th century, we can certainly say that Dr. Johnson was the last great critic of the age. We can also say that he delivered genius from bondage because he clearly believed clearly believed, and I repeat, I stress on the word, clearly believed that rules should not become prescriptive. Rules should not bind us. Rules should help genius to flower and to grow. He also told us that time is the best critic. Allow a writer a hundred years before deciding whether he was a great writer or not. He passed the sentence that only time can pass the final sentence. I'm just suggesting to you that we have to move from Dr. Johnson into the Romantic age and therefore you notice that we've got something from Keats. Johnson paved the way in many ways to the Romantic age by telling us that rules are necessary, but rules are not always compulsory. Remember that we then are going to have the great romantic poets, the great romantic essays, and the great romantic writers who will free literature from this bondage of rules, this bondage of prescriptive rules. And that is why we shall move on to the next beautiful age of English literature. But that's another story, that's another day, and that's probably another paper for you. My dear students, maybe you're looking at Dr. Johnson as a critic, but then you might want to look at other writers differently. And therefore, let us now look at the neoclassical age, 
and its writers and its critics once again. Let us go back to the neoclassical age and read them. And then let us get prepared for a beautiful, beautiful romantic age. I'm talking chronologically. I'm not talking about your papers. But I'm talking about how, as students of literature, it's important to link each age with the previous age. I'm telling you how it's important to understand how the neoclassical age gradually paved the way for the romantic age. I hope you enjoyed listening to Dr. Johnson as a critic. Go back and look at him as a lexicographer and as a poet too. And then you will see the greatness of this multifaceted personality. Thank you, my dear students. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, it is said about Dr. Johnson that at a particular sitting, he could devour 25 cups of tea. Oh. <laughs> I don't think we uh, deserve 25 cups, but I do think we deserve at least, uh, at least one cup after this lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I think Johnson, uh, as a critic, is definitely uh, clearer to our students today. And as ma'am hinted, we look forward to more lectures with you d or d bringing better or greater, I cannot say better or greater, but definitely great literary figures to you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you.